Hey, this is John Orberg, and if you got questions, you've tuned into the right video. For the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about basic questions that lots of different folks have. If you have some, I hope you'll send it in, that trouble us, that keep us from understanding about faith, or that uh, cause us to wake up at night, to ache for the people that we love, to wonder about our own lives, to wonder where God is. Uh, any question is fair game. We are a people of questions. If you feel like you're satisfied with all the answers and you know pretty much everything you need to know and um, your faith and mindset is rock solid, then you probably could um, skip this one or just audit it. But if those questions gnaw at you, this is the place for you. We're a place with a fellowship of the withered hand where those things that we most want to do, we often find ourselves unable to do. So we must come back again and again to surrender to the acknowledgement of our own personal inadequacy. We're a people with questions, and questions are a fundamental, indispensable part of life. And in these few moments, in this first one, I want to do really foundational questions, uh, just two of them. And the first one a lot of people wrestle with, at kind of an emotional level, is it okay if I have questions? Isn't the idea, if you're a person of strong faith, that you're not question stuff? A lot of people assume that religion, Christianity in particular, is a matter of telling people, here's what you're supposed to believe based on some kind of religious authority. And if you question it, then you don't have enough faith. And so uh, I want to start with that one. I was reading not too long ago, an Old Testament scholar who said that uh, the story of the Garden of Eden, the story of Eve, is really kind of anti-curiosity, that it was Eve's curiosity, her questioning nature that got her into trouble. And I want to start there by saying, actually, that's not the case. The Old Testament, uh, both the Testaments really are filled with questions. There is a certain kind of knowledge that is forbidden to us, and that's part of what the story in the Garden of Eden is. And that does run counter to the way that a lot of people think in our day, where we assume we can know anything. Um, what does it feel like to uh, have sex with somebody else's spouse and commit adultery? What does it feel like to... Uh, be cruel to a little child that's innocent? What does it feel like to have the thrill of stealing money from somebody else? So I've got it. Those forms of knowledge the Bible teaches, that's part of what the Genesis story is about. Those are off limits to us. Uh, there are certain things that, because we are made to follow God and to pursue the good, uh, we are not to know. But Curiosity as a whole, to wonder about things, to probe, to be curious, to be skeptical, is part of what it means to be a human being. Back in the garden, one of the wonderful little moments in it is when God brings the animals one by one before Adam, and Adam names them. And the idea of naming in the ancient world wasn't just attaching a label to something. It was to look at and perceive and observe its nature, to be curious about it. So for you and me to be deeply, deeply curious is a part of what it means to be human. And actually, that's a deep part of faith. In the Bible, the book of Psalms is famously the book of prayer, the way that human beings address God. And the most common form of Psalm is called the lament. And there's an Old Testament scholar at Duke that writes about how in the ancient world, of course, forms of prayers to the gods were quite common. I went years ago to the uh, town of Bath in England where the Roman baths were, and there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prayers that were written out a couple thousand years ago to the Roman gods. The most common ones were curses. They were pleas for the gods to uh, poke out the eye of this person or to hamstring the horse of this charioteer that I want to bet against. Uh, only in Israel were there prayers that took the form of laments, not just protests or grieving how things were, but bringing that to God and asking God, why, God? Where are you, God? How long, God? Why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. And the scholar says the reason those were unique to Israel is that only Israel believed that God was the kind of person who would be interested in hearing the laments, the complaints of people. And then when we come to Jesus, oh my goodness, the questions. 
the first time we see him when he's verbal, when he's a 12 year old boy in Luke chapter two, it says that he's in the temple and he's with the teachers of the law, asking them questions. Now, when Jesus taught large groups of people, very often he would give instruction. But when he was with people individually, most often he would pose questions. Who do you say that I am? What do you want? What were you arguing about along the way? One time a man comes up to him and says, how do I inherit eternal life? Ask Jesus a question. He immediately asked the man, well, what does the law say? And the man quotes the law, love God, love your neighbor, and then poses another question, who is my neighbor? Jesus tells the story of a good Samaritan and then asks another question to this guy. So who was a neighbor to this man? In Luke 20, the religious authorities are trying to trap Jesus, and they say, by whose authority do, do, do you do all these things? And Jesus says, well, let me ask you a question. By whose authority did John baptize? Jesus was the great question asker over 300 questions because I believe we grow in the face of questions in a way that we do not grow in any other way. We need questions. And this leads to the second question that I want to look at right now. The, the first one is uh, that asking questions is a, is a deep part of becoming a person of faith. There's a big difference between uh, uh, commitment, surrender to God, which we're called to, and then certainty or feelings of uncertainty, which we're not able to command by the will. And, and so the only answer to that is to try to pursue truth and come to know God. We just got back from a vacation to Jackson Hole, and we took our family to see Old Faithful. Now, if you find yourself feeling uncertain about Old Faithful, the answer is not work harder to believe deeply in Old Faithful. It's just observe Old Faithful, get around Old Faithful, watch Old Faithful, and over time, you will come to have faith in Old Faithful. Faith is a byproduct of knowledge. And if you come to know something or someone that is faithful, then faith will grow. So asking questions is fundamental. It's not something to be embarrassed about. In a faith community, we ought to encourage it, cheer people on the asking of honest questions. But then a second question related to this is, why doesn't God just make me certain? Why does God leave me with these doubts or these questions God could have written, made by God on every single molecule in the universe. And then we'd know, why doesn't he? And I believe this has to do with what it is that God is interested in producing in us. Years ago, one of my kids came to me and, and she was quite concerned about was she going to be able to get into the college that she wanted to. And I said to her, you know, even if I could wave a wand right now and give you certainty that you were in, I wouldn't do it. Because in this era of uncertainty, if you are able to continue to live with poise and grace and love for other people, you will grow in ways that you wouldn't if you had certainty. In other words, what she wanted was certainty, assurance, knowledge. But what I wanted for her was goodness. And what might be called strategic uncertainty has a fundamental role to play in character formation. I'll sometimes talk about a novel by George MacDonald called Thomas Wingfold's Cured about a pastor who wakes up one day and realizes uh, he doesn't know what he believes. And he goes on a long journey of coming to know and follow Jesus. In part of that process, he's caring for a terminally ill man. And at one point, this man asks the curate, his name is Thomas Wingfold, um, if he believes more fully in God. And Wingfold talks about the fact that he still has questions. And the man says, I wish that after I die, I could come back and tell you so that you would have no more doubts. And Thomas Wingfold says, no, even if you could do that, I wouldn't want you to. I'd rather have the good of not knowing. And then he goes on, I just want to read this for you. He says, I can wait, even if God would let me, I would not see him one moment before he thought it best. I would not be out of a doubt or a difficulty an hour sooner than he would take me. Eleanor Stump writes in her wonderful treatment of Job that because Job has to go through uncertainty, when for Job, uh, obedience to God is uncoupled from prosperity, 
there is a growth that happens in his soul. And if God had told him ahead of time, Job, here's what's going to take place, but don't worry about it. It will all turn out okay. Job would never have wrestled and grown in ways that he does because he has to face strategic uncertainty. I want certainty. What God wants for me most is goodness. What God wants for me most is growth. And that happens in the valley of strategic uncertainty. And so questions are a deep part of life. They're a deep part of our community together. They are okay. And God has good reasons for not giving us 100% certainty and answering all of our questions right now, even if we do not always understand what those reasons are. And so we ask and we probe and we trust and we look for truth and we do it together as the community of the withered hand. I'd love to hear about the questions that keep you up at night. And I will see you and we'll talk about more of them tomorrow.